Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. Um, this session's entitled um, Assessing the Global Rise of Breast Cancer. And it's an interesting topic for several reasons. I said the mic is just Is for the, the mic camera. on? No. Oh. No. Yeah, Mike. The mics are just for the camera, he said. Oh. So they don't actually, they're not amplifying. Oh, the mics are for the camera. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll all just have to use our outside voices. Sure. That's a good idea. Yeah, everybody move just come up just here with up. us. <laughs> that makes it much harder to escape. You know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'll do my best to speak up, and everyone will do their best to be active listeners. <laughs> and we'll work it all out. Um, one of the things that really struck us when we started the health program here at Aspen about four years ago was what I've always considered to be an artificial distinction between domestic health issues and global health issues. We have this tendency to think of mostly infectious diseases and infant mortality when we talk about global health, and then to think about health disparities and cardiovascular disease and diabetes and cancer when we talk about diseases here at home or in neighboring Europe. But really, when you think about it, a lot of the illnesses that we think of as being illnesses of wealthy nations occur across the globe, and they're critically important in those settings. When you have cancer in a poor country, it's a really much more difficult road that you have to walk than even the road you have to walk here when you have a diagnosis of cancer. I was fortunate to work with the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation um, on some of their gl breast global health initiatives, and we started talking about how we can do more to kind of promote the awareness that even if you're in Africa or if you're in South America or if you're in Southeast Asia, cancer, particularly breast cancer, may be something that you have to contend with. So that was one of our reasons for pulling together this panel, and we hope to perhaps launch another project going forward that's looking at this issue in more depth in the Middle East. But we thought this discussion, we'd keep it just a little more general and talk about the rise of breast cancer around the globe. So to do that, we have a wonderful panel assemb assembled for you here today. We have Ben Anderson, who's a surgeon and associate professor of surgery at the University of Washington in Seattle, but he's also the chairman and president of the Breast Global Health Initiative. And Dr. Anderson is just the most fun and kind surgeon, I must say, I've ever met. <laughs> pediatricians, have, pediatricians have preconceptions about surgeons, but, <laughs> but it's unfair, like any prejudice. So, but anyway, he's going to tell us a little bit about the epidemiology and talk to us about what we're really facing around the globe. Um, Evelyn Lauder, as you know, is one of our cherished trustees and also the founder of the, of, the breast, um, of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. We have so many organizations represented here today. I want to make sure I get them all right. And she also conceived of the Breast Center at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She's an incredible advocate for breast cancer and breast cancer research, and we're happy to have her here today. To my right is Tony Verstandick who's the head of the Middle East Strategy Group at the Aspen Institute. She also founded um, the Middle East Cancer Consortium when she worked at the State Department under Madeleine Albright and is still very involved not only in Middle East peace process, when she's not producing peace in the Middle East. <laughs> she's serving on medical boards across the country and also really working to promote medical diplomacy. And this is something that's a passion of hers and we're so fortunate to have her here on the panel today. And then our final panelist is, is Halo Muddlemog, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation, and just such an energetic force behind revitalizing the organization and really expanding, in particular, their global portfolio. And um, th this year they had the first, I'm going to get this wrong, the first race for the cure around the pyramids? Uh, actually, it's not yet. It's in October, and I invite all of you to go with us. <laughs> yes. So really taking um, the icon of the Race for the Cure to a new global level, and not just in the race, but also in the work that they're doing. So with that, I thought we'd start with Dr. Anderson, who's going to give us a little bit of an overview. Thank you, Michelle. Um, you know, actually, something I do with medical students is that I tell them that I begin by answering, asking questions to the people in the back. That always makes people come up, but I guess <laughs> we're, not, we're not being quite that aggressive here. Um, what I do want to do and I'm going to carry this with me because I don't know if my point – oh, there we go. So what I'm, I just want to show you a little bit of data about breast cancer and how it is distributed around the globe. So there's, in 2002, 1.1 million cases and 411,000 deaths. And this is an ever-growing number. 
The, it's anticipated that it'll be 1.5 million cases globally in next year, in 2010. If you look at the globe from a regional standpoint, what you can see is we do quite differently with this disease depending on where we're located. So in the wealthier countries, in North America, in Western Europe, what we're, the, those numbers that you're seeing here are ratios of mortality to incidence. That is, how many people are dying of the disease versus how many cases are diagnosed. And in the U.S., this figure has actually gotten down to about 19%. So we do better than one in five, that, meaning that about one death for every five cases that we diagnose. If you go to other parts of the world, it's more like a third when you look at South America. And when you get to Africa and India, the ratio gets much closer to 50-50. And in, indeed, I think that there are other countries that, that it, the figure would be even higher if we had good statistics on which to base this. So what you can see here is that there's something we're doing right, it would appear, based upon this data in our part of the world. And the question is, how do you translate this in a way that's meaningful to other places? Uh, if you consider the incidence of disease, that's what this happens to be Colombia, which is a middle-income uh, country. And the, what the yellow bars is the projected rate of rise of the population in the country going from 2005 to 2050. The maroon is the anticipated rise of breast cancer incidence. And this is without any changes in the risk factors or uh, other demographics. All it has to do with is the aging of the population. Because as the pop given that breast cancer is most commonly diagnosed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that as more women make it into this period, you can anticipate there will be more cancers diagnosed. And so the point of this is that there are some who are quite nihilistic about cancer and breast cancer in particular and say, gosh, we just don't know that we're ever going to make a difference. Well, if it's not viewed as a problem today, it will be a problem tomorrow. And therefore, the question is, are we going to wait till it's catastrophic? We certainly have a good history of doing that type of approach. But maybe we should prepare. Maybe we should think about what are simple or fundamental systems that are going to work. The nature of these challenges are many fold. And certainly one of the, the commonly discussed issues is westernization. So meaning that as people adopt western lifestyle, which means uh, women become educated. So they delay childbirth till later in life. Uh, our diets are, well, better, given this conference, maybe better isn't the right term, but certainly women are starting uh, menstruation earlier in life. It used to be average 12 to 13. We're now in the 10 to 11 range. And, and with delayed childbirth, starting periods early, going uh, later in life, menopause being later, use of hormone replacement therapy, we're seeing more cancers on the basis of that. While all of these risk factors are very important, clearly relevant to discuss, if you ask what fraction of cancers of the breast are due to these risk factors alone, it's a difficult number to assess, but it may be only 20%. Others have projected higher numbers, but that's assuming everyone follows the rule. The, the bottom line is there's still going to be plenty of breast cancer out there even when everyone's doing everything right. So I'm not arguing against prevention. It's a great idea, but it's not the whole story. Early detection is a huge issue, in, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries. And what you're looking at on this graph, this is stage of disease. So DCI is stage zero, non-invasive cancer. And stage one and two is viewed as early stage disease. Three is locally advanced, four is metastatic. In the US, our national statistics suggest that 90% of patients are presenting with non-invasive or early stage disease at the time of diagnosis. By contrast, in India, three quarters of patients are presenting with locally advanced or metastatic disease. And we know that locally advanced and metastatic disease is difficult to improve on outcome with all of the resources are available, and it's very expensive. This is, this is where our really very expensive uh, drugs are, have to be aimed. And so clearly, downstaging of disease is a key issue. Question, how do we do that? How do we implement this? It's not simple, and it's not just, oh, let's go do mammography. That's not the answer. We could talk about that in greater detail. 
But it is interesting to see how statistics have changed over time in our own country. So screening mammography got going in the 1980s in the U.S. because of the HIP trials that were done in the 1970s in New York. And because they showed a decrease in breast cancer mortality in women 50 and above by use of screening mammography, this really uh, took off. And what you can see is since 1982, there was a rise in breast cancer, but the primary rise in cancers were early stage disease, the DCIS and the locally advanced, meaning uh, node negative cancer. What didn't really change very much is the node positive cancers and the metastatic cancers. So when we do screening, you actually can anticipate you're going to find more cancers. The numbers of breast cancer will not go down, they'll go up. But what you'll see is that it'll be early stage disease. Interestingly, in the U.S., we're now starting to see these rates top and go down. And there's a big debate. Is that because we actually are sort of, we've cleared the field by finding early stage disease and treating it? Or is this because healthcare is less available and fewer women are getting mammograms? Tough question. But what I would argue, and I think the way we should be thinking about this in terms of breast cancer globally, is you need to think in terms of systems. You need early detection. It's not enough to just detect the cancer because you have to treat it. And in order to treat it, you have to diagnose it. You have to prove that that's what you're talking about. So this system of early detection, diagnosis, and treatment supported by a unified healthcare system is key. Absolutely key. And you need to think holistically, not just one area or the other. And the last point that I'll make, which was the point from the last session, as we're making decisions or recommendations or collaborating with people in other countries, you have to start making decisions about what are the most critical elements that need to be available within a system. There's some things that you really, if you don't have this, you can't start. That if you can't prove that it's cancer, if you can't get a biopsy and have someone read that biopsy and it accurately represent this is malignancy, you really can't move forward. Similarly, if uh, surgery is a basic level, there are some drug therapies that, or, or endocrine therapies. And then there are other ther therapies that are at the top end, this maximal end, that are too much. It may be relevant if you really have lots of extra resources, but the things that we tend to get so excited about, like breast MRI, which I think is a great tool and I use it regularly, it really helps me plan my surgeries, but if you asked, if I had to pick between that and, and other areas, well, actually, it's really expensive, and I don't know that it saves any lives at all. And it certainly makes no sense to talk about it in the setting of a country that doesn't have widespread screening mammography. So we need to distinguish the bottom from the top and build systems that are logical. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to mix things up here and go a little bit out of order. I wanted to jump to Hala who has, since coming on board at Susan G. Komen for the Cure, um, has really exploded their global portfolio. And she's also a breast cancer survivor. And I wanted to know why you, you felt that that was part of your mission on coming on board, and also why you reached out and partnered with Dr. Anderson on some of your projects in Ghana and around the world. Well, thanks, Michelle, but I think you're giving me way too much credit. I mean, uh, the Susan G. Komen for the Cure and Nancy Brinker and, and the group really started our uh, global efforts uh, in the 1990s, and um, I, need, I feel like I need to do a little full disclosure here. Uh, ben, Michelle, and I all went to Ghana together on our first ever global mission. Uh, and so, anyway, I mean, so we have a lot of uh, stories that will will spare you guys, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe later. But but, but okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, seriously, we were we were talking about one earlier today. Uh, I'll close with it. The uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Anyway, we really, in the, in the 1990s, uh, we started giving uh, grants, research grants, because I think the group, uh, and this is long before I was there, you know, realized, hey, you know, the cures for breast cancer may not be found in labs in the U.S. They could be found any place. So we started giving the research grants in the 1990s. And then, um, you know, the other half of this equation, which is the access and starting with the awareness and the early detection, et cetera, that needed to be worked out as well. And so we um, established in Italy and Germany our first two affiliates. And I think that, and this was only 10 years ago, they've just both, one's just celebrated and one's getting ready to celebrate their anniversary. And I think that their 10-year anniversary, and I think what we don't even realize is that even in, in Europe, in Rome and in, in Frankfurt, 
Um, the first time we had a race for the cure of the year, women did not want to be identified in the pink T-shirts. And so there were just a, a, a handful. And I'm happy to report that in May in uh, Rome, we had our 10-year anniversary. There were 45,000 women there and 2,500 women who said, I want to be identified as a survivor and wore the pink T-shirts. So, you know, I think sometimes we forget even in developed countries uh, it, it's still an issue. But more importantly, I think, for our, our work is that we really have – I have a lot of focus on the low resources and middle middle resource countries, and and we um, I, I think and again this happened long before I got there, but I think we were very smart to partner with Ben. Uh, he's a true pioneer and someone who really feels the the work that he's doing, and and he Cumin was a co-founding sponsor, I guess, of the Breast Health Global Initiative. And um, what I like about that, and what we've tried to to model our work on, is you you know you know what what works in, in our country, and we know what the, the modules are and the training and the pieces and everything, but obviously it has to be culturally appropriate and as Ben just described. So um, we've developed something um, uh, called Course for the Cure, and we're working on this in nine countries. And in, in those nine countries, um, we sort of take the common model, but it obviously it's about how does that work in these countries. And we bought – we brought uh, 20 women from around uh, the world, these nine countries, and we brought them to Dallas, Texas. And we had them be trained, so to speak. But, but what really is important is when they go back in their countries, even though they're being supported financially by us, is that they're working with the other NGOs on the ground there and with, with their governments and with their medical uh, people too to get these messages out. And, and what we'd really like to do, the first thing, is to downstage the disease because then you see the, the, the chance you have at, at survival. So, um, you know, and, and, and when you kind of put, put together our very um, grassroots way of looking at this and, and our courts for the cure, et cetera, with the fact that Nancy Brinker, our founder, uh, has just recently been named um, the Goodwill Ambassador for the UNWHO, uh, for cancer control. So this gives us an opportunity to sort of, you know, work up here with the governments and be on a world stage for cancer control. But then, again, we've got our grassroots. So it just it comes together, you know, very nicely the way that Ben was talking. And, um, gosh, I don't know which countries to talk about next, but um, I think maybe I'll, I'll focus a little bit on the Middle East because Tony is here. One of the great pleasures that I've personally had since being at Komen is we um, – We've, we have done quite a bit of work in the Middle East. In our first three countries that we uh, did work in is Jordan, Saudi, and uh, the UAE. And I had the opportunity to travel with Mrs. Bush on what really was sort of a groundbreaking trip. Um, as a matter of fact, we got to sit in a room with King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, and through an interpreter, he said the words breast cancer, which I thought was pretty, you know, pretty shocking in itself. But we have these wonderful people, Dr. Samia, who was mentioned earlier today by Aneta, and um, who, uh, you know, she wanted to do a walk for women. She's a, a doctor. She discovered her own breast cancer in um, Riyadh, and she was not allowed to do this by the government. But they did tell her that little children could walk and just call attention to breast cancer. So that's kind of what, what she's done to get the message out, um, you know, in that country. And, uh, you know, one of the other um, examples of, of how we try to, you know, listen and learn and use the resources that are on, on the ground is in Jordan. Um, we are working with Princess Dina and Princess Gita there and so kind of working with the governments. But the uh, the people who are doing the real work are the midwives, the people who go and visit the women uh, when the men are at work. Uh, they already have the messages about breastfeeding and um, um, birth control and that type of thing. So we've just added the breast cancer message on with that. So, you know, we obviously are trying to meet people kind of where they are and one of the things that we also done in, in the UAE is, uh, besides working uh, with Sheikha Fatima in, in Abu Dhabi, is in Dubai we partnered with Vital Voices to um, work with corporations, and we have something called Making It Your Business. And people um, in Dubai uh, have taken this 
module and are educating their employees about breast cancer. So there, you know, there are all sorts of ways to kind of to, to skin this cat. And we also um, did a conference um, last October, and this was the first ever MENA conference, the Middle East North Africa, Northern Africa conference, and we had uh, women um, from 17 countries in the region. They were survivors, they were doctors, they were politicians, and um, some of them very, you know, very much for the first time having an opportunity to talk about breast cancer um, and learn ideas from each other and, and carry out programs and all of that. Um, let's see, which, which other area of the world, and you'll have to watch me on my time. <laughs> Uh, you know, I actually, I probably should put in a little plug on this this Egyptian thing because um, it's you know we had our first ever uh, mission delegation to Ghana. It was the most wonderful experience of my life. I mean, seriously, it was just besides having children, of course. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we we were able really to uh, we were working with Hope Exchange, who has a hospital in Kumasi, and President Kafour was there, and we met these women who, you know, talk about standing up for something that, you know, we all take for granted. These, these women um, were sometimes moved out of their huts because the smell of the breast cancer got to be too much, and they would try to hide it uh, because, you know, it was, it, it, there was a huge stigma. So eventually when the, the tumors are coming outside the breast and are too, too bad, the women would, would be put away because of the smell. And so we, we, we met women who've been through that. We met women who, um, uh, by definition, beg for their medication and beg for the money to buy their medication. So it, it was really a very moving experience, which I think just sort of energized us all to, to try to go to, to other countries and, and, and do what we can. Uh, but anyway, that was our first m mission delegation, and we're taking a, a delegation uh, from the U.S. to Egypt this fall. And uh, we are going to have a race around the pyramids, which we think will be very cool. And um, we also have, uh, we're working with, with two different groups there, the Breast Cancer Research um, of Egypt, which is a, uh, Dr. Mohamed Shalon in, in Egypt. And he actually reminds me quite a bit of Ben and Ricardo, our guy in Italy. I mean, he's, he's this similar, he's a guy who kind of got this, got the bug, I think actually at our global um, uh, summit in Budapest a few years ago, and he, he's a breast surgeon and just very determined. And we've been working with him. So, and, and then we're also working with uh, Mrs. Mubarak's group in Alexandria. Um, so, anyway, again, seriously, I invite you all to to come. We're, we're um, our, I think our deadline for closing is August the 31st. But we we are taking a delegation with us because it's really important to you know, go into the communities and to really see these women and what they're going through. And we, we think it helps tie you know, all of our, our messages um, back together. And you know, if you kind of ask, you know, why is this important to you? Why, why, why does it matter to you? Um, I think that you know, probably all of you are, are like we are, which is um, the, to, people are dying way too young. They're suffering way too much. The palliative care is not there. And we feel at Komen that the model that we have are using and sort of a blueprint is one that we are happy to share and we're happy to collaborate. I mean, Ellen and I had a great talk before this, and there are just so, so many things um, that can be done together, and, and we, we think we're, we're building a really good model. And, and we've been very pleased recently that a, a lot of the people that we sort of helped launch in their countries, Dr. Meyer Kalefi in Brazil is a great friend of ours, Brother Charlie in Greece, and Princess Nikki in Africa, they have attracted other funding, things that are going to take them to the proverbial next level. So we, we're, we're very excited about our work globally and, um, and, and just, just very, very pleased. So. Well, you know, Evelyn, we asked you to talk about the global portfolio of your organization, and that's so important. But I also was realizing as I was sitting here, I want to know, you know, you're corporate executive vice president of Estee Lauder as well. What drew you to put so much time and energy? Sure. What drew you to put so much time and energy, um, in addition to your day job, into the issue of researching <laughs> breast cancer? And then to take it even to a wider scale and say, okay, we're not just going to fund research about breast cancer here at home, but we're also going to look around the globe. 
What made you so passionate about that? Well, there were three things that I would like to distinguish about my background. One is that I, my primary work is my job at Estee Lauder with uh, regard to the development of new, some new products and especially all of fragrance, and I'm involved with training. And um, that was one item. And the industry was involved in the uh, Look Good, Feel Better program, which they began in Washington, D.C., uh, back in 1988. And when we were having the first meetings, we saw the victims who happened to be breast cancer victims in a video that was presented with regard to the program that was going to be developed by the cosmetic industry, the American Cancer Society, and the American Cosmetology Association. I asked a very simple question. How many women die of breast cancer? I had no idea that at that time, which was about 1988, 44,000 people were dying. At the same time, the AIDS activists, who were so inspirational and so effective by knocking on the doors in um, Washington, D.C. to get drugs for their uh, problems, uh, were dying at the rate of 22,000 people a year at that time. And I said, wow, here I am an advertiser with many fashion magazines. I am going to speak to all the editors who I know and ask them to do stories about breast health because it isn't fair that they, I mean, it's wonderful that they had that publicity and uh, more power to them. But here we are, the women who are the mothers and the daughters and the wives and the grandmothers of families all over the United States, and we're not getting the message out about breast health, the only stories that the magazines were doing, besides the fact that it was a taboo subject and nobody talked about the big C, neither in any of the female breast, uh, breast or ovarian cancers, um, was the only stories that they were doing were on cosmetic surgery. So that was the first project that I got involved with. At the same time, the Pink Ribbon was developed by myself and uh, Alexandra Penny as the symbol for breast health, and we were told um, we should, uh, tra you know, we should get a copyright and we should do um, all kinds of things with it and protect the, uh, the symbol. I said, absolutely not. Let it get out there. It's going to be years before people even recognize it. We really need to get this going. We need to do early detection. We need to do self-examination because 80% of most cancers are found by the woman herself. So that got me going. And with my organization of beauty advisors in 80 countries around the world, it was not a big problem for me to get pink ribbons into their hands. And my husband and I were the ones who actually paid for the development, you know, to make these ribbons. And we gave them away. No names and addresses were taken. This was not a marketing tool to increase our sales. This was to give back during the month of October, which had been decreed as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, with no budget from the government, of course. So people could do whatever they wanted to help the cause. So the uh, so we went with awareness. Now we have our our 10th anniversary lighting monuments all over the world, of which there are more than 200 that will be lit in October, and that's the corporate thing. My second involvement was with Memorial Sloan Kettering, going on that board and getting involved with the new center that they were going to develop. And they only had mammography and oncology, and um I said, um, what else are you going to have? And they said, what else do you want? <laughs> and I said, well, how about psychological counseling? How about physical therapy? How about um, a library where we could go online and could see what's new? How about nutritional counseling? How about um, a boutique where a woman can go to buy a bra if she needs help with um, the um, any prosthetic device, an expert there on those kinds of things. It was implemented. The whole idea of 
um, coordinated services for one disease had actually never been done before. So they hired Co Coopers and Librand to see if this was a valid theory, and it turned out, of course, that it was. Um, as a marketer, I knew that it would be the mall of medicine, and if you make it convenient for the doctor, you make it convenient for the patient, you make it convenient for everybody, and it's now uh, something that is so overcrowded, this old center, that we're building a new center that is completed, and will be. Uh, the doctors have just moved in, patients are moving in in September, and um, we are three times the size uh, that than we've ever been before. It's 150,000 square feet. So uh, that's something about which I'm extremely proud. So now I was raising money for Memorial in California and in Florida, and people would say to me, well, why should I give you money for New York? Um, I said, well, the doctors go online and they share the information with each other. But we need it here, too. And I said, you know, you're right. And so I went all over looking for any breast cancer organization. I did not need this job. I had my own career. I really did not. But when, some, when you see something that needs to be done, if you don't do it, it's a sin, isn't it? So I had to start a foundation because I felt the one hole that existed at that time was the lack of focus on research. Everybody was doing wonderful, wonderful things in other areas. Awareness, mammography for underserved populations, uh, especially uh, in the Latina community and so forth and so on. But nobody was really, really getting their arms around research. So we developed the model of identifying people who were really renegades, who were able to think outside the box, like Judah Folkman, who was the first doctor to speak about anti-angiogenesis, like getting, um, um, you know, depriving the tumor of blood, um, and a variety of other physicians. Um, and we developed, the, by giving money for these early startup situations, that actually gave them the proof that their hypothesis had validity then they could apply for a grant to the NCI for more money. So we didn't start with a lot of money. We started in 1993 with something like $250,000. Today we've raised over $252 million, and this year we will have given away, by the time the smoke settles, because we're in the process of doing it since our fiscal just ended, um, about $29 million all over the world. So here... Because our title was um, Worldwide Situation on Breast Cancer, I wanted to sort of supplement some of the comments that were made, if I may, and dive right into my, um, my uh, opportunity to mention that in globally, one, as of 2007, 1.3 million people, uh, women, have, have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And that means that t every 24 seconds a woman is being diagnosed. It also means that si every 68 seconds worldwide a woman dies. That means from the time you sat down in this room at 2.30 until 3.30, over 60 women will be dying while we are sitting in this room. So that should give us some cause for thought. Um, the other thing is that in the United States, Canada, and Australia, 15, there's been a 15% drop in the incidence of, of uh, mortality as a result of early detection, as you so ably pointed out, and better treatments. Um, there have been only 41,000 deaths in the United States compared to 44,000, that's uh, in uh, 2007, compared to 44,000 in about 1988. Now that means that although the incidence has gone way up, 225,000 in this last year of the incidence, including DCIS, of which there were 50,000, um, you have this wonderful 
gap of figures going down in mortality because in 1988, 44,000, as I mentioned, died previously. So we are making progress in spite of what the New York Times said in their story of um, June 28th. Um, and um, the incidence rates are rising in the so-called underdeveloped countries or the low economy countries, um, especially Africa and Asia. And in China, even though our business is explosive in China, um, the cancer burden that uh, is a time bomb there, and it's predicted that the incidence will increase by 30 percent from 2010 to 2030. Um, so breast cancer mortality is expected to rise by 35 percent in the year 2015. Um, so now what I'd like to do is just briefly mention to you how we, um, you know, have initiated these uh, very exciting um, individually um, transformative life-saving advances. And one of them, as an example, is um, supporting imper important work in the PARP inhibitors, um, which is a new targeted therapy um, that may, you may have seen about in the news recently. The PARP inhibitors are now being tested to see if they make chemotherapy work better against aggressive forms of uh, breast cancer, such as triple negative subtypes, um, or um, in some cases, it might even avoid chemotherapy. Um, let's see, what else have I got? Um, the accomplishments of the foundation on a worldwide basis um, are quite long. Um, I've got a list that I can show you visually of the countries that we support all over, all over um, which is huge. But the global outreach, um, Fumi Olapati from the University of Chicago has a Nigerian, she's a Nigerian-born oncologist, is, has a clinical trial in Nigeria with black women uh, to see what it is about the fact that the genetic background perhaps of the black women, as, although there's so much similarity between whites and blacks, there's still some differences that prevent the black women from surviving as well under the same treatments that white women take. And what is the reason for this? And that's what she's doing. Dr. Richard Love is doing some work in seven Asian countries and seven African countries with a focus on Bangladesh. Our, uh, our own uh, Breast Cancer Research Foundation is supporting the work of Dr. Hedy Risak from um, Croatia, who is at Memorial Sloan Kettering, in actually um, translating um, the BRADs to be able to read breast, um, breast uh, uh, mammographies into, and we've given them money to translate these standard uh, reading techniques into Croatian, Serbian, and Russian. And now she's doing it for China as well. So that's helping in order to get women to get the correct diagnosis. And then we're going to hope that there's going to be some opportunity for cure and treatment to be equivalently accurate. Dr. Eduardo Kazap from the American Caribbean Society of Medical Oncology is working on, with cancer centers in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, per, and Peru. Uh, Dr. Efrat Levi Lahad in Israel is working um, with, um, I think it's um, Sherazedek Hospital, and we have Dr. Moen Kanan of the Palestinian Authority working with um, uh, the uh, Palestinian um, uh, University um, for uh, some of the work we do in um, the Middle East. Another project is with Dr. Sophia Mariver from the University of Michigan, who is, um, has a long-term goal of preventing and curing inflammatory breast cancer, which is extraordinarily common in North Africa. 
And these studies were started in Egypt and are this year expanding also to include collaborations in uh, Morocco, Algiers, Tunisia, and Sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda, and Tanzania. I'm proud to say that we are also working with um, um, the, uh, with the um, Susan Coleman Foundation on TBCARC, Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium, for the last four or five years. Um, this is uh, w uh, existing in 14 leading centers around the country. And it's, it's designed to get molecular structure of the tissue and to get the tissue from breast disease um, f and the subtypes and getting the correct numbers so that we can get it into the lab and develop targeted therapies. So there's a tremendous focus. Now the last point that I want to <laughs> make is uh, that we do have the lowest overhead. We promise 15% uh, in our actual figures to have uh, that as our overhead, but we've actually um, in the last eight years been at anywhere between 8 and 9%, and Charity Navigator has given us uh, a four-star rating uh, for the eighth year in a row, uh, which puts us uh, as a charity that this designation has had us outperform most other charities um, in the United States. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good segue. We've had a chance to hear about the epidemiology of breast cancer around the world and hear about what two major organizations, actually three major organizations, are doing to try to address those needs. Um, I wanted to turn to Tony at this point and say, okay, when you were Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, and you were starting the Middle East Cancer Consortium. What was the rationale that you used for why the State, State Department should get involved with breast cancer? That's a <coughs> very interesting question, Michelle, and I want to thank you for having me here, and I'm inspired uh, by what I've heard today by um, all of the panelists. Um, because I believe very strongly that in order to have effective diplomacy, you have to assemble a very robust toolbox. And in the Middle East, uh, as we all know, uh, we need all the resources that at our disposal. In the Middle East Cancer Consortium, uh, we part I partnered with uh, then director of the National Cancer Institute, Rick Klausner, who um, was uh, willing and, and thought outside the box. And everyone said, oh no, we can't do this because it would include Israel. This was in the immediate aftermath of the Oslo Agreement. And I said, but of course we can. And we need the practicalities in establishing a framework um, in order to have real uh, research tethered with real dialogue. And the Middle East Cancer Consortium is, I'm proud to say, still operational today and consists of Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Palestinian Authority, and Turkey. And while that's good, it's not good enough. And I sit here and listen to Evelyn and Ben and Hala, and I was very impressed by uh, Mrs. Bush's trip to the Middle East. And I think it underscores again how our Arab-Israeli diplomacy has been so richly tethered in bipartisanship, and um, I commend that initiative. However, it has to go forward in a meaningful way. And uh, so why do I care about this? And I care deeply because um, I believe very strongly that, and especially being here today, and, and you have assembled an extraordinary um, series of panelists to think big ideas. I think the Middle East Cancer Consortium and the cancer registry that it established, established offers an opportunity to take that consortium, that registry, and marry it up with uh, the cancer registry and the Middle East Partnership uh, for Breast Cancer Awareness, and also to look at, Evelyn, some of the things that you've talked about, to marry the research, the real science together with um, and have a cancer registry that helps support um, both science research as, and collaborative research um, together with um, diplomacy. I'm not prepared to accept that 
women in Abu Dhabi and the Emirates more broadly should have a 60% higher incidence of breast cancer because um, they, breast cancer has been a taboo. And while I am very pleased that the King of Saudi Arabia permitted young children to uh, uh, offer an opportunity to promote breast cancer awareness, that's just not good enough. And my colleague, um, uh, who was the former uh, and the first uh, female foreign minister, uh, deputy prime minister in the Middle East, Rima Khalif, who was prime, deputy prime minister in Jordan, authored, uh, sponsored what has now been a, an extraordinary reference point for the Middle East. And it's the UNDP report on the four deficits in the Middle East. And it's the de one of the deficits, uh, there are two that are most re relevant for our conversation today. It's the deficit of knowledge and the deficit of education, mm -hmm. the deficit that women are not full participants. And breast cancer awareness and breast health and scientific research, Ben, we heard it today um, in uh, one of the earlier panels, offers opportunities to create collaboration and to promote dialogue. Uh, one of our colleagues is in the audience today, a, a young woman whom Michelle and I have uh, worked closely with, who herself is Iranian-American, who is a Navid, uh, who is a um, researcher at Harvard, Med a professor at Harvard Medical School, who's an HIV AIDS uh, researcher, but her husband is a oncology researcher. She herself is Iranian-American. I am not prepared to accept that we can't think outside the box, even in the midst of the huge turmoil that's going on in Iran. We need to offer a um, creative dialogue and some transformational ideas. President Obama, when he was in Cairo, talked about the issue of science envoys, and I think it is a very timely initiative, especially with regard to the Middle East. But I'm struck by the fact that when I was a young person, and we will not uh, reference um, age, uh, when I worked on Capitol Hill uh, for the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee some many years ago, uh, in fact, he authored legislation that embedded science as a tool, science and technology as a tool of our diplomacy. It's taken a very long time, but I think this administration and with the appointments um, in science, um, in, in the broad range of science, um, will hearken a new day. But we sit here at Aspen, the great convener of uh, dialogue and, and um, va value-based leadership. I think the private sector can move this dialogue forward on science, on health, and partnering with women in a way it, they, it does represent some transformational ideas. And so I would like to just conclude by saying I'm not, I think we need to join together to scale up resources, as Evelyn and Hal have said, their organizations are working together. Michelle and I are interested in, in moving forward in um, creating a toolbox that supports health diplomacy and science envoys that are looking at uh, meaningful science uh, to support researchers like uh, Navid who, um, who can help uh, engage uh, societies like Iran and more importantly create stakeholders in the Middle East for stability. So thank you. Great. Well, believe it or not, our hour is almost up, so I oh. want to make sure oh we gosh. have time for questions. Um, What she said? Why is the incidence going up? Does anybody know? Why is the incidence of breast cancer going up? Well, you have to remember that incidence is defined as the number of cases diagnosed. And so part of the reason that this happens is because actually more people are going in for diagnosis and our record keeping is better. Part of it is because the population is aging and, you know, we're having more, as we do better with infectious disease, cancer becomes a bigger issue. More people are getting into these uh, age groups. And there also are risk factor issues that we have bad habits that are, are favorable. Although, actually, I, I guess I want to make a point about that. 
some of the bad habits aren't bad habits. You know, the, actually the education of women and having women not have children at age 14 and actually going to school and becoming professionals, this is associated with heightened breast cancer risk, and we don't want to undo that. So that's, you know, that, I think it's just very important to keep this all in perspective. It is, we can project, though, just on the basis of demographics that we will continue to see more and more breast cancer out there, and so we're going to need to address this. I think you also have to um, you have to keep in mind also that as uh, that Dr. Anderson said, uh, the population is going up. There are more people in the world, and the diagnostic tools are better. Fear has been reduced, and women are much more compliant about uh, doing self examination, getting mammographies. So it's possible that the disease has always been there, but no one has really known about it, and now the fear being reduced, you have, an, you have um, a, a seemingly higher incidence. Don't forget the increase of the population in the world in the last 20 years has gone up 2 billion by 2 billion people. We are now a, a world of 6 billion people. And so it's bound to be linked. And if you remember the chart about um, uh, in uh, Colombia, you saw how high how the population was growing but you had the incidents going up, the predicted incidents. And um, I can tell you from smoking, and we, we had, didn't discuss smoking, but smoking doesn't only affect the lungs, it also uh, uh, increases risk for breast cancer. Um, alcohol increases risk for breast cancer. Obesity increases risk for breast cancer. With obesity on the rise, you're bound to get increase of, of, of that disease as well. We have a question down here in the front. Um, I'd like to know uh, from Dr. Anderson, do you think inflammatory breast cancer is on the rise in the United States, and why is it so high nationally? Well, that is another in very interesting and highly debated topic. So the, if, if you go to Egypt, what is stated is that they are seeing 15% of breast cancers that are, are diagnosed as inflammatory cancer whereas it's more like 2%, 3% in the U.S. The diagnosis of inflammatory cancer is tricky, meaning that one person could say that's inflammatory cancer and another clinician would say, I don't think that that quite meets the criteria. So it, it becomes fuzzy. The other issue is that, and I, this gets to the first question as well, we actually, because we're finding more cancers, it may be that the absolute number of inflammatory cancers isn't that much higher. It may be that it's actually quite similar. Most of the rising demographics of breast cancer are in, in this country are in postmenopausal women. Cancers in the 40s look really quite similar around the globe. So the, the, it, it's a complex question that, that I think warrants more study, which is some of the work that's being done now. So Ben, you just said, what you were just saying is that the younger cancers look very similar, but there's a higher percentage of younger cancers in developing settings. It's not so, people will say, oh, there's, there's more young cancer in low and middle income countries. Actually, there's, a, there's the highest incidence of young women with breast cancer is here. It's just that we are the curve keeps going up, 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 up for after age 50, where it seems to level off in other places. And what we don't know is, is it really leveling off? Is it the point that you made, Ms. Lauder, about prevalence? That maybe the cancer's there, but they're just not, you know, older women aren't going in for diagnosis. There's a lot of reasons, social reasons, they may choose not to be evaluated. We have time for two more questions. This gentleman. Quick. Okay, um, <laughs> that's a short topic. Um, we used to think that for more family relatives with breast cancer was worse. And what came to be recognized was, no, there's certain families where it's a genetic predisposition. And Dr. Mary Claire King, and with colleagues funded by uh, the uh, Lauder Group, um, they... CRS. 
by CRF, um, <laughs> that they, they first described BRCA1, which is a gene on chromosome 17Q21, that if you inherit a mutation in this gene, a deleterious one, you are greatly predisposed to breast cancer in the order of 60 to 80 percent lifetime risk and a 20 to 40 percent chance of ovarian cancer. Now, that explains, and then BRCA2 has sl slightly different but, but same idea risk factors. BRCA1 and 2 explain about 10 percent of the cancers that we diagnose. There's another 10 percent that appear to be familial, meaning that, boy, we're sure getting more breast cancer than you'd expect, but it's not due to BRCA1 or 2 based on our genetic testing. And the other 80 percent, 80% are sporadic, which is roughly translated beats me. And what it probably means is multiple genes interfacing with environmental factors. But the, 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 it's, the genetic cancers are not the large group. They're the minority group, which is why not having a family history is not protective. That's, it's important for women to know. Just because no one else in your family didn't have breast cancer, that doesn't mean, oh, good news, you don't need to have screening. Most breast cancers are in families that never had breast cancer before. Yeah, another simple question. Um, <laughs> well, the question of, of uh, there have, are certain gene mutations that are thought to predispose to radiation-induced damage. And uh, hereditary telangiectasia is in this group. And so as people started to speculate, gosh, maybe getting the mammograms and or doing radiation therapy, which is part of breast conservation, that that might predispose to breast cancer. I think it remains a question rather than a fact. And what's interesting, the radiation-associated cancers that we, that we see in therapy are actually not carcinomas at all. It's angiosarcoma, a completely different family of, of cancers. The, the advent of digital mammography has made a big difference because the amount of radiation in, in mammograms is really quite tiny, and digital mammography gets it even smaller because they can take a picture and then adjust it and do digital manipulation. Um, the, I think the, where the bigger concern is, I, and I'm not in a radiation oncologist or a radiologist, but it's with the CT scans, and there are other scans that use quite a bit more radiation. I think it's hard to argue that radiation is good for you in this setting, so trying to weed it out is a, is a good plan. And with that, I'm sorry we'll have to close, and I invite you guys to catch our panelists at other times to ask your questions. But please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> Thank you.